our genes to not do that. If you raise kids together, and uh, this happened in uh, the kibbutzes in Israel, they raised the kids together and basically acted as if they were all a family. The idea they thought was if you raise all these kids together, they get to know each other, and they will then marry within that and keep the group cohesive. It turns out they almost never would marry one another because they were, they, if you're raised with individuals who are children at your same age, that's usually your relatives. And so you don't want to mate with them because that would be incest and there's all sorts of genetic reasons why incest is bad. So it's not, even though they weren't related, even though they knew they weren't related, there still was this deep aversion to that process based on genetic cues that are built into us, to all of us, animals, all, all animals and humans to avoid that. An interesting question that comes up, this came up in my evolution class when I was an undergrad. Uh, the professor talked about a specific example of a male fish that mates where the male basically attaches to the female and gets absorbed into her body. And basically becomes a little tiny pimple that produces sperm every so often. Because in that species, the males and the females almost never come into contact. So if you ever come into contact, it's better to become an appendage of the female than to risk not mating with her and never finding another female again. And his quote was, males aren't just superfluous, they're silly. So why do we have them? It's not necessary. Plenty of organisms, including some animals, can reproduce without sex. Why is it that we have a 50-50 ratio of males? Because it doesn't make any sense. If you do the math, at least initially, you'd say, well, you need one male for every you know, 100 or 1,000 females in many species. Why do we have 50-50 ratios? When you know that most of those males won't mate at all. What seems to be happening there is that cost-benefit analysis, that yes, your, your male offspring, most of them won't mate, but if one of them mates, he's probably going to mate with a lot of different females, and therefore his success will be quite high. So while the cost of males is potentially very high because you waste time raising them and they don't produce any offspring, the one or two that do produce offspring is going to be very high. Whereas in females, the cost of producing a female is similar, you know, raising an offspring is the same male or female, the number of offspring she'll produce is pretty much a constant. It's based on how many eggs she can produce. So a female has kind of a constant payoff, but a male is either nothing or jackpot. And if you get the jackpot male, you're in great shape. So that's why it works out. If you do the math with those calculations worked in, it works out that on average you should settle to a 50-50 ratio because of that potential jackpot that you can get from having males, even if most of them are a waste of time. And this goes back, and you can even see some things within males there's a, a pretty much direct correlation size in mammals between the size of the testes and how hard they have to compete for, with other males for mates. In the case of gorillas where there's a troop where there's one male who does all the mating, the size of the testes are actually quite small. You find bonobos where there's mating pretty much every time somebody has food or <laughs> five minutes, uh, the testes are significantly larger. They're huge. And relative to body size, bonobo testicles are huge. Make human males are somewhere in between. So this suggests, again, that in our case, there has been some extra pair activity that is selected for males that have testes that are large enough to produce enough sperm, but not so large that they drain energy, because sperm are actually, well, we don't think of sperm as being expensive. They are actually fairly expensive to produce and maintain. And so you sort of settle on a size of testis that gives you enough sperm to compete, but not so much that you're wasting energy that you're not going to be able to. And infanticide is a couple of questions. I was just going to say, I, I read an article that was kind of along those same lines, too. And without trying to get too sexually graphic here, it was talking about um, the shape of the male penis and, be, because, and, the, and the fact that we have a thrusting action when we mate and stuff, which is really no evolutionary benefit for that. A lot of, uh, apparently, a lot of animals don't have that. Mm -hmm. They just ejaculate the sperm and that's it. But the thrusting action, along with the shape of the head of the penis, is causes um, a male to actually be able to remove mm -hmm. um, sperm from another male donor. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, yeah, and some, know, some males have really them. complicated, you know, some species of the males have these really complicated grooves and cups that help create like a plunger action right. to help <laughs> draw out any sperm. But yeah, in the case of the human, they say even in our case that it does have the shape that will help draw out any sperm that might have been deposited by a previous mate. Yeah. So even the shape, of, and there's also evidence that shows that the female is better at absorbing the sperm from a male who is not her mate. So women who are cheating actually absorb the sperm better into their reproductive tract in terms of to the point where it could cause fertilization. So there's also things going on, again, with female choice and male choice, that the female's internal activity, even though it's not conscious, is definitely set up 
to sort of view because those, those two things, like testicle size and the shape of the penis in the male in humans, would kind of imply to me that uh, we were arguing about this in our discussion with Kathy and I, that we're not monogamous <laughs> creatures. And she says we're monogamous with occasional cheating. I said we're polygamous or whatever because it, even though we don't, we have some cultural things that you know I'll tend towards monogamy as a species. I think we're more towards. Polygamy. Well, I, I, I think it would, this is one of those things like you mentioned, the source of human behavior is very difficult to sort out because all of this stuff would have been evolving long before we got to the stage we're at now. Right. And so what the evolutionary pressures were on human populations, say, 100,000 years ago when we were first really becoming homo sapiens, it's hard to say. I wouldn't be surprised if we had something similar to what chimpanzees have, where we had a troop with maybe a few males and a few females, and there was definitely mating beyond just a single pair of individual, any species where you find males and females in that close proximity, there's generally going to be at least some attempt to mate outside your pairing. But we do tend to be socially monogamous in almost all human societies, which implies that at least you, know, you have an identified mate, and there may be some you know, extra activity going on. But where that first came from is not clear. Ancestrally speaking, we probably were more of a polygynous or polyamorous or uh, polyandrous, depending on whether it was males or females or both, that kind of had say. But um, yeah, there's definitely some evidence that that may have been ancestrally our trait. How that has been modified over time, it's a lot more difficult to say and what factors have affected it. And this also goes, this infanticide idea kind of ties into that. It ties into the ideas of jealousy, that you, again, don't want to raise kids that aren't your own. And again, widespread through the animal kingdom, when a male takes over like a lion pride, when the male takes over, the first thing he tries to do is kill any cubs that are there. Uh, same thing in many, many primates, the male, because they're not his, and he knows they're not, well, knows, they're not his. And so if you kill them off, you don't waste time raising them, and the females are more likely to go into reproductive receptivity, where you can then produce offspring that are yours. And if you're a male lion, you've maybe got a couple of years to run that pride. So that can be a big deal in terms of how fit you are. So it's not uncommon to find this. And we find the same thing in human populations, that... Uh, abuse of children tends to more often come from the individual who's not related, you know, the, the boyfriend or the girlfriend of the person who is the actual parent. You know, the evil stepmother from Cinderella and all the other fairy tales, that's the same basic idea that I don't want to waste time devoting energy to you, you're not my kid, I want to get rid of you so that my kids can be the ones that get taken care of. So this is, you know, an ongoing, you know, the whole uh, Isaac and Ishmael story that supposedly separated Islam and Judaism was the same idea that, you know, Ishmael was born from uh, the maid and Isaac was his son with his wife, so his wife said, get rid of Ishmael, that's not my kid, I don't want him, and so they were banished and now we've got 6,000 years of them hating each other over that sort of thing. So, true or not, it's the same basic idea. And this, even, this also goes back to um, organisms that will abandon offspring who are not going to survive. You know, if you saw 300, they talked about leaving the kids who were deformed out in the wild to die and things like that. That's also fairly common in human societies where the, you know, malformed children would be abandoned uh, because they weren't usually going to survive anyway, so don't waste energy on them when a time, you know, at a time, especially when infa uh, infant survival rates were really low anyway. The last thing you want to do is try to raise one that wasn't going to survive. <clears throat> Many animals do the same thing, kicking eggs out of the nest abandoning their, uh, their young when they can't raise them properly because they don't have enough milk in the case of mammals is very common behavior in the animal kingdom. So there's nothing that goes on in any of those sorts of things is any different. 